I want to bring up this presentation. Thank you for coming, Alan. Are you on here? Tony or Todd? Better? There we go. Well, guys, um, I really appreciate Tony and Bob and Steve and Todd and the whole Ashton family for inviting me. It is kind of funny that it was roughly 15 years ago, and, and here we are living within a real short distance of the other. And then we, when we hooked up in Oak of Raton, Florida, I think it was, when we met each other uh, back in 2005, 2004, something like that. Um, I'd like this morning to be interactive, so be prepared. I'm going to call on you, all right? Um, and I'm going to give you a chance to volunteer, but if I don't get volunteers, I'm pretty sure you're going to want to volunteer. Because we're going to go through some ideas today that uh, I've been blessed to just be a part of for about the last 20 years of working in the charitable planning space for people with real big hearts. And much of what I share with you today is involved, is integrated in the process that we call legacy planning by part of. And this is transferable. You can take many of the things that you hear this morning back to your practice tomorrow and implement them. So be prepared to think about one or possibly two big ideas you hear in the next hour and a half that you will go and implement tomorrow and see some differences. Along this way this morning, on this 90 minute journey, I'm gonna give you some gems. And these are gems that I've learned from other people. The one thing that I can share with you is that we wanna be lifelong learners, and I'm a lifelong, who in the room's a lifelong learner? Okay? I heard yesterday when I was in Dallas, that there's a difference between a learner and a learned. People say I'm learned, but that, what does that mean? They're kind of shutting themselves off with no ideas. Okay. Always read, he's a learning person. That means they're done learning. And they don't want to learn, which is unfortunate. So if we're lifelong learners, and we want to be growing and expanding and, and serving others the best way that we can for as long as we're called to serve others, then this is a wonderful business to be in. And I was fortunate to join in this business about 25 years ago after I got a picture from banking, where I was in the banking business for about 17 years. Uh, so, I've pretty much been in the financial business for about 40 or 41 years now. And it's been a wonderful journey. And the journey's not over. It's not over. So, let me do this. I want to go really quickly around the room, and as I point to your table, just tell me city and state, where you're from. Idaho Falls, Idaho. Idaho Falls. University of Place, Washington. Good to see you. I'm going to be in Tacoma on Friday. Alan Moore Winfrey, though. All right. Phoenix, Arizona. Say again. Phoenix, Arizona. Yell it out, Phoenix. Wapsit, North Dakota. Oklahoma, Washington. Minot, North Dakota. Good morning, Iowa. Washington. Eugene, Oregon. San Antonio. San Antonio. San Antonio. San Antonio. I've been there, but we're more stuff through there. All right. Great job. Well, thank you. Good. I'm going to be there. Say again? Western Australia. Awesome. I've got a couple of buddies from Australia that are involved in a group of them. I'll come back to you. All right. Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma? All right. Camp Washington. Camp Washington. University of Puget Sound, 1976. Middletown, Every community that I just heard you talk about, you have people with big hearts. And these people do not have to have big values to get involved with charitable giving. I had an epiphany about 20 years ago that I felt that the things that we do in the financial services business, business can be very, very helpful for people that want to walk through life serving others. 
And in the business that we're in, we have, we have tools and we have products to support that. But we also have opportunities to learn from folks that really don't know what they don't know. And the vast majority of people in the charitable planning arena that are my clients or my prospective clients, they don't know what they don't know. But more importantly, they don't know the answers, they don't know the questions, and they don't know who to trust. So the vast majority of capacity in charitable giving is sitting on the sidelines right now. Sitting on the sidelines, wondering who I can turn to to ask good questions, to do good things that will have fantastic outcomes for others and back to them. So over the, over the years, I've learned from others. And the things that you're going to see on the screen this morning, they all came from other people. None of this was from me. It was from other people. And many of those folks have passed on now. They're no longer with us. But I think that if we are passionate about learning from others, particularly when I was new in the business 25 years ago, I wanted to learn from people that lived 30 years longer than I had. So when I was 40 years old, I was called on 70 year olds. And I wanted to learn from them because they had phenomenal life experiences from which a young 40 year old kid could learn from. They're not gone. I've been to their memorial services. But the, to the degree that we have a passion to learn from those sort of folks, we can do great things. We can turn right around now at age 62 and give it right back. Now I can give it. So I'm going to start on a couple of things. What I'd like to do, and by the way, there is, yes, I'm in the life insurance business, but most of my clients don't even know me as a life insurance guy. And he's my legacy advisor. He's my charitable advisor. He helps them with work with you. Oh, I guess I did buy that product. Who, who, who was who was the insurance guy? I don't know. It was whatever we're down said. What was the premium? I don't know. It was whatever he told me it was. They don't keep track of stuff. They just know what it does. And this is not about dying, it's about living. Okay? Lifetime values based legacy planning is about living, it's not about dying. So when we get fully entrenched in the lives of the people that we work with, it gets very exciting. Very exciting. So I'd like to do a little exercise with you right now. And I won't call on you unless I get no hands in the air, but I'm pretty sure I will. Um, framework here. Framework. I'm generally calling on people in the age 55 to 90 year category. I have zero clients under age 50, zero. I have children of clients, and grandchildren of clients under age 50, but for clients that were paying the bills for our fees and maybe buying some of the product that we use, they're in the 55 to 90 year old category. Um, most of the time, your net worth are north of $10 million. Most of the time. Sometimes north of $50 million. And the key is, it's not around the size of the net worth, it's around the size of the heart. There's a lot of selfish wealth out there, and I generally don't deal with the selfish wealth. I don't deal with selfless wealth. So if people want to get involved in the charitable giving arena, I suggest you start thinking about where you can build relationships with giving people. And don't worry about how much that works. Just hang around giving people. And, you, and, and things will come your way. So for the first part, I'm going to do a little exercise. I'm going to ask you to either, you can either be yourself or be one of your clients that's in the age 55 to 90 category that has a reasonably sizable net worth. So you need to decide what that is. Be that person or be yourself right now. And I don't want you to overthink this. I just want you to give me words that come to your mind right away when I, set, when I ask you the question, what is estate planning? Quickly, what words come to your mind? Yell them out. Lower tax. Lower tax. Other words. Beneficiaries. Beneficiaries. Keep going. Legacy. Legacy. Keep going. Transfer. Transfer. Now, remember, be your lay client that doesn't really know anything about this business, but they're worth five, six, seven, ten million bucks. Church. Church. Did I hear that? What is estate planning? <laughs> Probate. Probate. Keep going. Trust. Trusts. Keep going. Gifts. 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 Keep going. Taxes. Taxes. Okay. We did that in about 54 seconds. All right. I'm going to keep all this up here. I think that these are peeling off. I think they are. I'm just going to sit them over here for a bit. Let's do this. 
real quickly. Don't overthink it. Do not overthink it. When I say the word legacy or legacy planning, what words come to your mind? Legacy, your legacy planning. Quickly. Say again. Tax free. Keep going. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Now we're going. Family. Family. Keep going. Scholarships. Scholarships. Keep going. Love. Love. Keep going. What is legacy? What is legacy planning? Come on. For the future. Remembrance. Keep going. Say again. Leaving someone. Leaving. Leaving someone. Yes, <coughs> Leaving someone money. Values. Thank you. You said that. Keep going. Your name living on. Name living on. Here's a big aha. Here's aha number one. I call them gems. Throughout the course of the next uh, 75 minutes, a gem's going to come up. Here's the first one. <coughs> Leaving a legacy is not an option. You will leave a legacy. Every single person in this room will leave a legacy. I can guarantee you you will. Okay? Did Ronald Reagan leave a legacy? Oh, yes. yes. Did Adolf Hitler leave a legacy? Oh, yes. Did my father, who passed away 11 years ago, leave a legacy? Yes. Where is it? It's in me. Okay? You will leave a legacy. It is not an option. It is not an option. So how are you going to live your life out tomorrow, next week, to support the things that you believe are important? This is legacy planning. Does it include estate planning? Absolutely. Does estate planning, traditional estate planning, include legacy planning? The answer is no. It doesn't. I'll give these two ideas words. I suggest if you like what you're hearing, you take notes. Because I do not have handouts. I can get them to you later if you want. <coughs> Over here, I call this the what and the how. Trusts, wills, investment portfolios, um, private foundations, uh, IRAs, just all the tools of planning. Over here. Revocable Living Trust, all right, GSD Trust, Defective Trust. You guys do them all? We do. They're all out there. What's, and over here, how about the who and the why? Who and the why? If you want to get involved with big-hearted people that sometimes have pretty big crowd sheets, I suggest you learn how to have conversations over here. These are conversation starters. They're going to lead to phenomenal outcomes. And the last 30 minutes of my talk this morning, I'm going to show you three of them. And there was a big insurance piece in every one of them. Because it's a natural part of giving. The reason I have an insurance license is because it's a tool that demonstrates your love for others. That's all it is. It's a tool that demonstrates your love for others. Every policy that I've sold in the 25 years I've been in this business, my, my clients have the same rate of return. Every single one of them. Zero. You are dead. You do not own it. It's owned by the trust. It's owned by your children. It's owned by your private foundation. Someone else owns this, and you funded it out of your love for them. Every single false. The ones I'm going to show you here in the last 15 minutes. Okay? So if we're going to get involved with charitable kind with people with big hearts, wouldn't it be appropriate to learn how to converse over on the side of the page? What does it we care about? What, what gives you energy and joy when you get up in the morning? All right. And the day, when the alarm went off today, another day, praise the Lord. We get to go at it. Who do we get to serve today? So I was talking to Charles last night. What do we get to give away today? What can you give away today? Think about that. And when you put your head on the pillow tonight, right I want you to ask it for yourself. What can you give away? Can we all give something away? Absolutely. Time, an idea, a friend. A referral. What can we give away today? Every single day, giving away something. Right. 
I'm going to do it quicker. I'm going to do that quicker. Uh, here it is. I'm going to go quickly. We're doing a two and a half hour presentation in 90 minutes, so I'm going to skip through some things that I would normally go a little bit longer on. But where we are right now is in the first one. A little bit around a legacy discussion, okay? Legacies are the way that you live your life. It's a value system. It's how do you want to be remembered, okay? We're going to talk, I just mentioned a little bit on the who and the why and the what and the how. What and the how, tools, products, ideas, taxes, wills, documents, who and the why. What? Is the state plan required? What happened? No. Now, I, live, I live in the state of Washington, but every eight and a half million the population of the state of Washington, everyone's got a plan. They all got one. It's either a plan by design or a plan by default, but they've got a plan. And so my role as a state of Washington advisor, primarily, not always, but primarily, is to show them what their plan does, even if they've never even seen an advisor they have a plan. Can we, are we prepared to tell people what their plan does? I think, it's a, I think you should be because it's an eye-opener and then it'll allow you an opportunity to invest in their lives and take them to a different outcome. What is legacy? These are the things that we've heard before. This is a workshop that I've run for 20 years and some of the guys in the room have been to it. We did one a week or so ago and we're going to do another one in late October or November. But it, it's, it's Designed to give like-minded professionals ideas to guide clients on this side of the, this, this side of the chart. Because we can learn this. This is easily learnable. Many of you guys have initials after your name, like CFP and COU, and other initials after your name that says, you've been to school, you learn some things. Okay. But in school, did they tell you to have a, how, how to have a conversation from the local net? How to have a conversation from below the neck. That's where I always start. Great place to start. How can I, how can I enter a conversation with somebody and never make a statement? Everything that comes out of my mouth must be in the form of a question. Ooh, try that. Next time you sit with somebody, you cannot make a statement. If you talk, you must ask a question. I'm never successful, but I'm always thinking that way. Next question, next question, next question. Because what happens if I'm always following up with another question? Guess where the outcome of that conversation is going to go? It's going to go to their desired destination, not mine. Okay. What's an other centered conversation versus a self centered conversation? This is all this is about me selling this product. Would you rather be known as a vendor of a financial product or a counselor of wisdom and knowledge? I prefer the latter. Who do you care about? What causes belief, convictions, act, and what actions do you take belief based on your belief system? How you live what, what are non-negotiables in your life? I suggest you can probably have some. Write them down. I do. Non-negotiables. How do you show it? If I were to say, Tony, I want to borrow your checkbook and I want to borrow your calendar and I want to look at every place you wrote a check last year and every place that you spent time last year. And I'm just going to presume that his checkbook is going to record all of his expenditures and his calendar is going to have every time commitment on there. And if I were to go look at that for the past 12 months, I could tell you a lot about Tony, at least according to where he spends his time and his money. Now, if you do that for yourself, would it be accurate? Try it on your size. Okay. Do you need to make some changes? Do you need to say no to some things? Do you need to bring to some call, by the way? One of those resources that most charitable givers have, and I, I think that everyone in this, everyone in this room is a philanthropist, because the primary resource for philanthropy is not money. It's time. It's time. What are you giving of your time? Because we've all got the same amount, 24-7. Anybody got 25 hours? No. Anybody got eight days? No. We all have the same resource. So how are you going to allocate it on this side of the ledger to demonstrate who you are? There's very philanthropic people out there that have very moderate resources, financial resources. I want to get rid of you guys. Maybe you guys can help me out. I'm going to ask everybody to have one of these. Good luck to help Everybody should get one of those. That's around. I mean, we can do it a little bit. And while you're getting that, I want you to just think about 
the five words that are in the middle of that card. You can read the card later, but I just want you to just kind of look at the five words in the middle of the card and think about them for a minute with regard to this question. Here's the question as you look at those five words in the middle of the card. What is wealth? What is wealth? I propose that all five of those words answer the question. All five of them, not just the last one. The last one is an important tool to bring maximization to the upper four. To the upper four. Okay. Have I not met people that are rich in the upper four, modest in the last one? Absolutely. Why would you raise them? You didn't have any of them in the bottom one. But where was she in the upper four? So, as we work with people with big hearts and have below the neck conversations, we get to find out what they really care about. And if they've been blessed with some resources, most of the time the resources are disengaged in philanthropy. They're being held by a wealth advisor that's just growing and growing and growing. I was talking to Charles last night, it's not uncommon for me to see someone's 1040 and their 1040 is this big. What's line 31 on page one of 1040? Adjusted gross income, right? Oftentimes it will be seven digits. Oftentimes it's seven digits. And I turn the page and I see taxes paid for four or five hundred thousand. It's usually around thirty to thirty-five percent. And I said, What do you live what, 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 what's your lifestyle require? Oh, I live off of two hundred and fifty a year. So we have seven fifty, eight hundred more just being piled up, piled up and being taxed out. Because their CPA and their wallet advisor does not know or care about this conversation. You can see how this evolved in every three one, every one of our clients we get into is what, what's the purpose of your wealth? You ask that with your clients, what's the purpose of it? You've got this liquidity event coming up, your S corporation stock of $3 million is going to turn into $33 million of cash uh, on, on February 15th, 2018, because you've got your liquidity event all lined up. process of engaging him with his 20-year-old grandson every 90 days to 
from the day that he died. I said Jack was 1995, and Jack was 72 years old. I said, and he had had a stroke, he was partially paralyzed from one side of his face. And I said, Jack, how long do you live? I'm serious, how long do you live? Okay, Jack, here's my, here's my challenge to you. You're going to live 10 years. We're sitting in 1995 right now. You're going to be around until 2005. Why don't you sit down with your grandson every 90 days? He's now 20 years old. You could have 40 one on one meetings over the next 10 years with your grandson. And you can engage in his life and find out what's going on in college and where the challenges are. And when he's walking through and again, does he want to even come into the family business? And the family business is now looking a little bit different because of the recent sales transaction and just too much through. And you get involved with his life such that his relationship with you is not what it is right now. It's much better. Look at the first word in those five words. What's the first word? Look at that. That's what he's talking about. Okay? He only made it seven years. He died in 2002. His grandson is now four years old. I've been in his office. He has a picture. He has a say on the wall that was one of the in quotes from his granddad. From one of the words of wisdom that you imparted upon him during that seven year period from 1995 to 2000. And it's on his wall, and it's priceless. He did not go into the family business, and that's okay. And that's okay. But boy, does he remember his granddad. Where's his granddad right now? In his heart. That's legacy. Now, did he have stacks of legal documents, including some life insurance and some other things? Yeah, absolutely. We helped create some of that stuff. That's not where his concern was. His relationship with his grandson. So next time you're sitting with a prospect, I'm going to give you an aha. People have stuff going on in their life. Everyone in this room right now has stuff. I do. Can you define it? And oftentimes when you're in, when you're in conversation with someone on these ideas, they're not even there. You might see them physically, but they're not even there. What sort of questioning and conversation techniques have you developed to determine that you can even hold the meeting? I've canceled meetings because when I found out what stuff was going on, there was absolutely no reason to hold that meeting. None. Okay, we postponed them. Why would you do that? I want them to sign that application and do that check. Where's your mind? Is it on them or is it on you? I believe we are in the service business. And if we're in the service business, we need to serve others. And when we serve others well, our compensation happens. It happens. And it happens for the right reason. In the early years, in three, 1995, I was three years in the business, and I was just learning, and I was on a steep learning curve. Be careful on this one. Be careful that you're not be careful to close the sale too quickly if you've never opened the relationship. Focus on opening the relationship, not on closing the sale. Okay. If you close the sale and you've never opened the relationship, they're coming to come back and fight you. A year later, they said, Alan, I don't remember that. Uh, Alan, you didn't tell me that one. You know what, Alan, more to think about this, I don't think I want to do this. Well, you want to mind the thing and I want, I want all my money back. I had to refund a $75,000 commission out of my bank account. Because I never opened the relationship. And if I would have opened the relationship, I would have walked. Because I would have found out that some character traits in that gentleman, even though he was worth $14 million, he has some character traits that I did not agree with. Today, uh, that's where I start. Who are you? Think of your best client and try to describe them without using anything regarding finances or balance sheet or numbers or who are they? Here. That's where we're going to find out their capacity to be philanthropic. And it's in everybody. Conventional estate planning. We got a little bit of it. We got taxes. Nobody says death. 
and that's often that it's over here. Death and taxes, multiple advisors, in the eyes of your client. This is why 60% of America has done nothing. They've done nothing. Because they think about all that stuff, and it's confusing, it's uncomfortable, it costs too much of money. When I'm done, I've got a three-ring binder that's got all these documents in, I don't even understand them. Testamentary, inter vivos. Why do they talk all that Latin? Just put it, in, put it in English. Okay? I've been in those attorney's meetings where my clients are just staring at his face because the guy's talking a lot. And I have to say, John, could I interject here? Would you allow me to paraphrase what you just said? Because I saw that they were lost. Absolutely lost. Confusing, uncomfortable. How do we do that? Oh, God, the the news is born. We've got a new textbook coming. Oh, well, how can we do all this planning and keep on changing the rules, right? Trump's going to eliminate state taxes and we have a I can assure you, continuing tax changes will always happen. They will always happen. If you're going to wait for the perfect time for no more tax changes, you're going to wait for the it's just going to happen after you stop reading. Always will happen. Who signs your documents? Do you sign them or does President Trump sign them? No, you sign them. Do you sign them or does Mitchell Connell sign them? Just Mr. McCullough. I mean, I'm sorry. They are not signed by your congressman. They're signed by you. All right? Now, if you're going to be doing it with such flexibility that it changes the goal, well, like, who's going to be in the White House eight years from now? Tell me, are we going to have a bubble Congress or a Democratic Congress eight years from now? Are you going to be alive eight years from now? I hope so. I plan to so we keep on thinking about changes in D.C. or the state of Washington or the various states represented here. It will always happen. I guarantee it. Just a question of how often. All right. So those things up here we keep track of, but they do not slow us down. They do not slow us down. Here are some gems that I see. If, if you like getting into this area, these are easy things to follow. Easy principles in terms of estate planning with generous people on an intergenerational basis. That's my world. Estate planning with generous people working with two generations at the same time, sometimes three. Two ways to plan. You can plan with your family or you can plan at your family. <coughs> How many people plan at their family? The vast majority. Very unfortunate. I don't. We always will engage conversation with two generations. Always. One of the things my dad said 25, 30 years ago, I had him at the time, I just barely started the business. <coughs> he said, Alan, beware of the destructive nature of secrecy. How many plans have been established out there that have three ring binders that are in effect? And the beneficiaries of those plans have no idea what they say. In fact, those beneficiaries of those plans are named as successor trustees in this trust and in that trust. They may even be called a, a personal representative, and they don't even know it. Okay? The destructive nature of secrecy. Very destructive. Two types of, there's only two types of plans for the eight and a half million people in the state of Washington or the 330 million people in the United States of America. And every one of you in this room has got one. You've got a plan by design, you've got a plan by default. Which one do you have? Can you describe your plan in three sentences? I can. And if you want to challenge me at the end to tell you my plan, I will. So you can remember that. Can you describe your plan in three sentences? Maybe four, but it should be less than 20 seconds. Only three places to steward wealth while you are living and when you pass away. And it goes in this order when you pass. Charity, taxes, people. Charity, taxes, people. All right, remember that. Very easy to do. So when we're working with clients, we only have three buckets from which we're, we're, we're intentionally directing assets during lifetime and at passing and both. Wrong button. Oh, there we go. This is where it was. Hmm. I'm going to stand on this one for a 
Who knows what a million dollar round table is? Anybody ever been there? Okay. I went there a long time ago. It was 1994, 1995. Yeah, the main stage presenter, I think it was in Dallas, Texas, in 1995. He talked about this word called fear. And he says, that's an acronym. It's an acronym for false exaggerations appearing real. And you have people living in it right now. You have prospects, you have clients living in it right now. You turn on the TV, and I did, unfortunately, at quarter to seven this morning. Every one of their stories has that underlying gird of fear, uncertainty. The world's coming to an end. All right, just tuck our tail in the tail of your legs and just give up. We just turn that noise off. I did. And I muted it and I turned on the sermon. Okay. So, false exaggerations appearing real. I can assure you, uh, I'm going to ask right now, be truthful with yourself. In the last few years, how many have experienced some fear in their own life? Yes, we have. Now, if you've broken through that fear, and now you can look back on where you were fearful, be thinking about, did it ever really exist? Did it ever, or did I create, I'll use one in your business. I, I know you all have this one. You're calling on so-and-so, and they're right on the top of your prospect list. They're not only an A prospect, they're a triple A prospect. And you just want to get them as a client. And you're in pretty good rapport with them when you call them and you see them, and, and then all of a sudden, you're going to call set the appointment, and they're in silence. They don't call you back. They don't call you back. They don't call you back. Goes on two, three, four, five weeks, you go, my goodness, what did I do to offend them? Three months ago, isn't it? What did I do to offend them? And then finally you hear back, oh, Alan, we went on a safari to South Africa, we were offline for five weeks. And what did your mind take you into because you thought you did 